should have this handout. That's, and we're gonna be talking about safe and natural pesticides. I work for NDSU. Um, I, like to, I like when I give a talk, I don't like to give a lecture. I prefer lots of questions and conversation. And if anybody has a question at any time, or if you have a comment that you wanna share, I love it. I like to learn these things too. And so let's just keep this informal, and we're gonna learn about safe and natural pesticides. Okay, to start, hey, did you guys see the weather forecast for like the next 10 days? It's gonna, it's gorgeous, right? It's gonna be like in the 70s. So what does that mean? That means that we can officially say, even though we had a blizzard last week, you know, that the winter of 2021, 2022 is dead. Okay, there you go. No, sorry, that's not the appropriate response. <laughs> I'm gonna ask for a moment of silence. <laughs> so thank you for that. So you may wonder why do I respect winter? And that's because of my topic today a safe and natural pesticide. What's the number one pesticide in North Dakota? Winter. You know, how, like here's an emerald ash borer. How, isn't that beautiful? How come emerald ash borer is not, there's plenty of food here for it to eat. There's lots of ash trees. How come the emerald ash borer is not here, but it's in Minnesota, it's in South Dakota, it's in Montana. How come it's not here in North Dakota? It's cold. Yeah, one of the biggest reasons is because it's like damn cold here in North Dakota, right? Okay, so, and it just has a hard time surviving. So again, I'm gonna talk about lots of safe and natural pesticides today, some you never thought of, and that's one of them right there, winter. Every time, every winter when it hits like 25 below, everybody's freaking out. I don't appreciate it either. But actually, I see the silver lining. I see the fact, hmm, good. Just like a few more days of this, and it's gonna destroy so many bugs out there. You know, they don't have a furnace to go to when it's 25 below. They just freeze to death. So there's a, there's a good point about 25, 30 degrees below zero. Think about that next time your teeth are chattering and you're freezing. But bugs do come. Here's a cabbage worm. Just ready to pounce on a cabbage leaf and start to enjoy a wonderful feast. Now, in North Dakota, we've got a history. Look at, look at that, wow, look at that. Look, what do you do when you see something like that in your garden? How do you react to that? You know, some people say, well, I guess my sauerkraut's gonna have more protein in it this year. But when I see that, I get mad. That bug came into my garden. I want revenge. And I'm like many North Dakotans, this is the way we were out in the prairie too. <laughs> you come to my property, punk, make my day, you're gonna die. And they didn't mess around back then. They used arsenic of lead. That was, the, that was what the university recommended to spray on your cabbage 100 years ago. But now we've modified, we've updated our recommendations. Now we got the dirty Harry Clint Eastwood approach, and we use like carbaryl and pythoids. That's what seven is. Seven's the most common traditional insecticide. But, and it's kind of, okay, I have to, I have to admit, it's kind of fun using that product. Like, I remember, I remember killing cabbage worms with that. You spray it, and you can see the cabbage worms ingest it, and all of a sudden you start, they drop off the plant, and they have spasms for a few seconds and then they die right before your eyes. It's like great feeling of revenge. It's just so sweet. But you know, that's a toxic loaded gun you got there when you use a product like that. Even though it feels good, it's toxic, very toxic. And when I see like your seven on a tomato plant, I saw this up here at uh, Burley County Community Garden. I go, oh my God, what are they doing this for? Like there's no insects there. 
So we're, we want to get away from that, the unnecessary use of pesticides, and if possible, focus on the safer insecticides. And fortunately, there's lots of natural insecticides that are widely available today. And that includes Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, Azadiractin, which is neem, spinosad, pyrethrin, and insecticidal soap. These are all natural and generally much safer than those traditional insecticides. Here's a table of toxicity. And to measure toxicity, we do what we call an LD50, a lethal dose that kills 50% of the rats that are tested. So the, so the more toxic, the lower dose that's needed. And the least toxic, the higher the numbers needed. Like even BT, it's off the charts. It's like harmless to the rats. Insecticidal soap, it takes a lot of soap to kill a mouse. And you know, I think, I don't know how you guys are, I'm kind of old, and I don't know if have you ever ingested soap in your life? Like, like when I said a bad word when I was a kid, my mom put a bar of soap in my mouth. I didn't die from it, okay? We don't do that nowadays. It's not that toxic. This is the oral toxicity. Actually, malathion is not an organic product, and it's, it's not especially toxic in the short term. But here you see these green ones are the organic ones. Neem, spinosad, and pyrethrin. It takes much higher amounts of that compared to the sevens that are used today. Like, let's say the seven dust, carbaryl. It is like 10 times more toxic than neem, for example. Because it mean you need 10 times as much exposure to have a, to have a death. So these, these products are safe and natural. Let's go through them now. Bacillus thuringiensis, this is a natural bacterium. The thing about BT, it must be eaten by the pest itself. It has to be eaten. And this is all in your handout. What does BT do? Again, like, I don't know how you feel about when you want to kill a pest. Like for that seven, I can spray it and I can see the death immediately. It feels so nice, good. But maybe you prefer torturing a pest. Like two days of a, of a rot gut going on before it kills over. Is that a better, is that appeals to you more? Then maybe BT is a good way to go. It's highly specific. So there's different types of BT. The most common type is dipel and thuricide. It will only kill caterpillars. It will not kill bees. It will not kill this. The most common one will not kill beetles. Okay, so if you've got a cabbage worm, you can spray BT and you'll kill the caterpillars, but you won't cause harm to other wildlife or to other insects. So it's very target specific, which is a good tool. As as a directin, it comes from the neem tree seed. This, this insecticide has to be eaten. Okay, How does it kill? It has another unusual way of killing. First of all, once it eats the neem, the insect loses its appetite. It doesn't want to eat anymore. It's repelled by the food. And then also, the insect goes through hormonal changes. So like, it doesn't become an adult. It doesn't want to have sex. It doesn't want to have children. So it just kind of like it has no appetite for food or for sex, and it just slowly withers away. So very effective and interesting way to control it. It controls many pests. Neem is very safe for bees because it has to be eaten. And so this is, this is a good insecticide to use like on flowers. So the bees visit the flowers, but they don't, they don't want to eat the flowers. They just want to get the pollen, so the bees aren't affected by neem oil. And neem oil and azagard are common trade names. Another one, spinosad. <clears throat> this, is, this is probably the hottest right now. It's a soil bacterium. Really a fascinating story how this was discovered. It was discovered in a rum distillery in the Caribbean. There was a scientist, a chemist, who went down to the Caribbean on vacation. And he laid out his beach towel and laid on the beach, and he was getting eaten by bugs. So he said, I got this, is terrible, I'm out of here. So then he walks down the beach ways, and he puts down his beach towel again. No bugs. 
He goes, hmm, this, this, this was a really unusual chemist. He just thought, wow, what's going on? And this chemist had a tendency of digging up soil from all over the world, wherever he went, to test it. He was trying to find like human medicines. And this time the chemist, he just stumbled right, right nearby where he laid the towel a second time, was a rum distillery. So he dug the soil from that, and from that they found spinosad, a natural insecticide. Just an eccentric scientist. It, can, it paralyzes the pest. It's often used especially on Colorado potato beetle. That's our choice for Colorado potato beetle. <clears throat> it controls many insect pests and mites, and here's some common products. Pyrethrin is another one. It's derived naturally from chrysanthemums. It paralyzes the pests immediately. It controls many insect pests and mites. Pyrethrin especially has a very short life in the environment. And so that's why we prefer, it breaks down quickly in sunlight. So you like to spray it at night, and that way it can last a little bit longer. But, you know, it's kind of, there's good things and bad things about these insecticides, in, you know, as far as the, uh, the residue effects. Like, this has a very short residue, very short life, which can be good in the environment, but it doesn't give you long-lasting control. So that might mean you may have to spray it more often. And lastly, there's insecticidal soap. Insecticidal soap will dry out the pest. You know, like if you put soap on your cheek, it feels dry. Same with an insect. And that's why when you, when you use insecticidal soap, you have to spray the insect itself with the soap. You have to target the insect itself. And then it'll dry up. It has no residual. So insects that fly on the next day have no impact. So you've got to use thorough coverage and repeated sprays. But again, very safe. Does anybody have any questions about these products? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, you have solitary bees. You have yeah. Okay, the question is what do you do about solitary bees? Because solitary bees, like the leaf cutter bees, they cut the leaves and so they could be affected by the chemical. So in that case, yeah, that would be a concern. And so I would look for products that are less toxic, like the neem oil would be, and of course, like insecticidal soap would be very non-toxic to them. But among those that I mentioned, the one that would be probably of most concern would be spinosad. Spinosad is very toxic to bees. But the thing about spinosad, the studies show that spinosad, after just three hours, it dries so much on the, the plant material that the bees are not affected by it. But that's, again, like what we want to spray at night when the bees are not active. But I would stay away from that spinel set. Any more questions? Yes. For insects underground? Yeah, for like root vegetables? You know what? That is a, that's a great question. because. I have to say pretty much for uh, safe, natural insecticides, our toolbox is pretty empty as far as that goes. So what we do is we focus on other things. We focus on crop rotation. Like let's say I'm going to plant carrots there. There could be like wireworms or other insects that were in my carrot crop before. Now I'm going to plant an area in my garden where I had no carrots or potatoes before. Okay, so it's less likely that pest is there. So we use crop rotation. Also, a lot of times in those situations, manure can, these things are worse with manure, is, is impacted, is put on the soil. So I'd be, be cautious about using manure in the garden as far as that goes. <clears throat> That's really a hard one. Even with chemical, the traditional chemical insecticides used for gardeners, we really don't have a great product for that either. They're too toxic, and Congress just took them away so because they're too toxic. So that's a hard one. No easy answer there, buddy. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, how often do you apply the product, and when can you eat the product after spraying? Okay, those are key questions. It's different for every product. <clears throat> for most of these 
products I'm talking about, there's like a zero to one day waiting period. So a very short waiting period, like seven for a lot of vegetables. The traditional chemical is like a seven day waiting period from spraying to harvest. Like even like BT, <clears throat> actually I did a lot of work with kids' gardens. And, and, te and I, I was trying to teach the kids about insecticides. And so I said, okay, you guys, we're gonna use a safe insecticide and there's no waiting period. So technically I could spray the crop and the kids could walk right behind me and harvest the vegetable and be okay. But that was one lesson that I never repeated. It was just stupid. Don't want to teach that. But these are very safe products. And how often do you apply? <clears throat> Listen, the first thing to ask is, should I apply? Right? You need to identify the past, and your local county extension agent can help you with that if you need help. And then once you identify the past, then you take the, then you take the appropriate approach. You select the proper insecticide. And then you read the label. The label will tell you as far as how often you need to apply. Okay? Read the label. Okay, she had a problem with flea beetles on her kale. We, you know, we, I do a lot of research on fall crops, fall vegetables, and flea beetles are by far the number one problem. And they love kale, they love all the, the crucifer family. So, the fact you got it last year and you haven't had it before, I would say you've been pretty lucky, actually. So you should be happy. But, you know, does, but do insect pa does weather affect the insect populations? Of course. <clears throat> like, why are we, why do we have so many box elder bugs last fall? Because we had a drought. <clears throat> we rely on spring rains to flood eggs and introduce diseases into insect populations. When it's dry, insects don't have, their eggs survive and they don't, they have fewer diseases. So, so far it's raining, that's a good sign. Maybe fewer flea beetles. And then later on, I'll give you a special weapon for flea beetles, okay? Stay tuned for that, that's a teaser. <clears throat> How about this, you know what? A lot of times for some insects, another safe natural insecticide is just a jet spray of water. Like if you have aphids in a tree, just blast that sucker. Or you got mites in your spruce tree, just blast that spruce tree. Because you think like, are they just gonna fall down and crawl back up? Just think about it, like just imagine how big that wave is. That's a tsunami coming on that little aphid. Very few survive, very few. It's a tsunami effect. So don't forget, that's a good option. Here's the flea beetle option. Row covers, the best protection against any pest, against any wildlife, is a physical barrier. And so row covers are very effective against flea beetles. The sunlight goes through, the rain goes through, but the beetles can't get in there. So that's your best, I think that's, that's what a lot of organic gardeners use to control flea beetles, floating row covers. And also it extends, it gives a little bit of warmth in the fall. So, you know, kale's already tough as nails, he can survive 25 or so. You get a row cover, man, you're gonna have kale for Christmas maybe, I don't know, okay. How about ladybugs? Ladybugs are safe and natural, and a lot of people say it's a gardener's best friend. Do ladybugs work? Absolutely not. Total waste of money because of the way the ladybugs operate. If I'm Tom's ladybug company, what I do is I go up into the like Sierra Mountains when I see these giant clusters of ladybugs hibernating, and I get my vacuum cleaner, suck them up, and I put them in a box and I sell them to you. These are all ladybugs that are hibernating. They've got a fat layer on them, just like a bear that hibernates has a fat layer on it. So what are these, in nature, what they do is they wake up and then they fly down the mountains and they burn off their fat layer. So what do they do in Bismarck? You release them in Bismarck. They're gonna fly, they're not hungry. They gotta burn off their fat first. So studies have shown that within 24 hours, this is how many of the ladybugs will be in your garden. This one. 
And that one had a broken wing. It couldn't fly. Okay. So unless you want to help a gardener in Mandan, don't sprinkle the ladybugs in Bismarck. It's worthless. Okay. Tomatoes are the most popular garden vegetable. The most common insect on tomatoes is a tomato hornworm. Okay. This is a fun pest because the hornworm it's called a garden glutton. Even its scientific name means glutton. A hornworm eats four times its weight every day. So that's like for me, 200 pounds. That means I have to eat 800 pounds of food today and more tomorrow because I'm growing. A hornworm in just a few weeks grows to such an extent it's comparable to a cat in three weeks growing to be an elephant. That's how big, it, big and fast it grows. And so when you see a hornworm, probably, well, whenever I see a tomato hornworm on a tomato plant, I'm out there in the garden in the morning, and I notice that about a third of my vine was eaten. You know, it just ate up my vine. And so then I go, what happened? And then all of a sudden, I turn the vine over, and there's that big hornworm staring at me and, you know, burps. And that was a good meal last night. So what do you do with hornworms? Well, you can use BT. Like, that's a... It's a Caterpillar. That's what I do. I just give it my old size 12 shoe. There you go. That's what I do. It's the end of that. It's very safe and natural insecticide. Okay. Feels good. And there's not that many hornworms out there. Because, you know, they, they all eat so much. They don't, there's only, only enough food for so many of them. So maybe you'll get 10 of them. It just feels good. Quick and easy. Okay, last, let's wrap up with some monitoring. Safe, natural techniques to monitor for pests. The number one apple insect in North Dakota is the apple maggot. And it makes these tunnels. It makes dimpled fruits. It's caused by an apple maggot fly who sees the apple, and it punctures the apple to lay its eggs in. And then the eggs hatch, and they make those maggot trails. It's interesting that the apple maggot hangs out all winter. Just a, it's kind of like my teenage boy. Just sleeps forever. And same with an apple maggot. It sleeps all the way through spring. It doesn't even want to wake up until the 4th of July. That's when it wakes up. And so what I can do, I can set out some apple maggot traps in my apple trees, and you put a sticky covering on them, Tanglefoot, and you can buy these apple maggot traps at major garden centers and definitely online. You can put like five of them in your apple tree, and so you wonder like, do I need to spray my apple tree with an insecticide? Well, let's just go out and look at the traps. No maggot traps, and the, and the maggots are very attractive to this red apple. All the, green, all the apples are green except for this red. They think that's soft, ripe, perfect to raise a family in. They all go there, and you can just wait. You can just wait till the maggots uh, show up, if they show up. And then when they show up, then you got your decision to make. Like, do I want to kill them with a spray, or do I want to have applesauce this year instead? So it's an effective monitoring device. Lastly, Japanese beetles, another pest that has struggled to get established in North Dakota because of our cold winters. But it, it, has got a, it is established in our state, and actually, historically, Bismarck has been one of its favorite towns to live in. Japanese beetles are devastating to flowers, especially roses. And another thing, like I said, you have to know your enemy, right? You have to identify your enemy and know it. So a Japanese beetle likes two things, flowers and sex. That's what it likes. And so how do, you, how do you deal with the Japanese beetle? You look for its weakness. They've got Japanese beetle traps, and you put a lure in it. The lure has flower and sex pheromones in it. Very powerful. Japanese beetles cannot resist it. In fact, it's so powerful that the Japanese beetles can fly from 200 feet or more if you put a trap in your garden. So 
So what do you do? It's, it's almost like too effective of a trap. That means like every Japanese beetle in the neighborhood is going to come to your garden. We don't want that. So what do we do? We don't put up the garden. We don't put it in our garden. We give it as a gift to the neighbor. <laughs> They'll be so happy and pleased when they see their trap full of Japanese beetles, they think that we saved their crop. But actually, they took every Japanese beetle from the neighborhood. Thank you, buddy. There you go. Very effective. And there they are. Man, just, they, they're oozing out of this thing sometimes. Just like they, they thought they were going to have flowers and sex. They just all came in. They can't resist. And they're just going to, I don't know how, what they're doing in there, but they're going to they're die. They just die. So don't forget about monitoring to safely control pests. Okay. There you go. So. I wish you all a happy spring. I think we're really on track for a wonderful spring this year. And does anybody have any questions that I can help you about? Yes. Do flea beetles combat leafy spurge? Uh, not flea beetles. I'm not an expert on leafy spurge, but there are other types of insects that are used to attack leafy spurge. Are you trying to find something good about a flea beetle? I think you're going to be looking hard. Yeah, there's a offhand. There is an insect, that, like a parasite insect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There, there are, there are ways that I think all you got to do is Google. I think you can find that. And always, when you Google, put university in your search so you get science-based information. Did you have a question? Okay. Who else said? Yes. Yeah, the question is when you use, put up an apple maggot trap, you got, what you have to do is you hang it up and then it'll last for a few weeks, but then you, then you can clean it with like mineral spirits and then put a fresh coat of tangle foot on. But really, the key is the beginning. That's really good. Like when I wake, if, because if they're out there, they're going to wake up and find your plant place. And then it's like the first couple of weeks are the critical ones. Put in the neighbors. Give your neighbor an apple maggot. Now, you're, now we're in the giving spirit. I love it. Now you know what to get everybody for Christmas in your neighborhood. <laughs> there you go. Any other questions about pesticides? Okay, there you go. Thank you, everybody. It was a good time tonight. Thanks.